Well, thank you everyone for braving the elements today. It's much appreciated, I promise you. We were getting um, messages from friends from the morning saying that, uh, listen, it looks tough to arrive today. So I know how much effort everyone's put in to be here. We're very thankful. Uh, for us, it's an important moment uh, because we've been wanting to have the opportunity to invite Naveen to speak about the artist uh, whom we are showing in this gallery and who we've shown recently at 47A, a gallery that we share with Srila Chatterjee, who's in the audience today. It's a two-part exhibition that we've hosted. The reason for it being a two-part exhibition is because we wanted to look at the multifarious aspects of the artist designer's career, and I use those two words um, pointedly because in both exhibitions we've tried to tease out different aspects of uh, Subramanian's life and works. At 47A we were particularly keen to look at aspects of his career that encompassed his work with the Weaver's Service Centre in the 1950s, his work with uh, toys starting from the early 1960s at uh, the yearly Baroda Fine Arts Fair and then of course his work with illustrate children's illustrations and books from the 70s onwards, but especially in his relationship with uh, Naveen and Seagull. Here in Kolaba, the exhibition looks at different aspects of his work, similar period, but in particular we're interested here with his work with murals, um, something that begins in the late 1950s. We have incredibly rare examples of preparatory sketches and maquettes which date from the early 60s, uh, a mural, an important mural that he undertook in Lucknow. Uh, the end of his work with Weaver's Service Centre is also represented in this exhibition. And then the work he executed in the mid-1960s, uh, arrayed behind us, these are works which are often referred to as, as his markers series, his um, work often in abstraction, it was a period in which, of course, he went to New York where he was on a Rockefeller scholarship, imbibed uh, much of that moment of abstraction also in, in America at that time, um, but also very much in sync with the works that had happened earlier in India at the Weaver Service Centre with works which were engaged with the mural um, projects that he, he had undertaken. So in that spirit, these two exhibitions sort of talk to that period from the 1950s until, let's say, the mid-1960s. Um, and perhaps we can talk a little bit about the works um, with Naveen afterwards. But why Naveen today? The reason is because we have invited him to take us through a text that he wrote in 2006. 16, Naveen, which has never been published in India. It's only, it will in fact be published for the first time tomorrow in scroll. Um, but it's a very special text which he'll tell us more about, which gives an insight into this extraordinary person that is K.G. Subramanian. And after Naveen tells us a little about the text, reads the text, we will then talk to him about his own relationship with Subramanian. So without further ado, <coughs> Naveen, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thanks, Maud. Yeah, uh, this was written really very shortly after his death. Um, kind of for myself and um, not for any commissioned, you know, or publication at that moment. And um, a lot of it is about myself, I will warn you, and I hope through that lens of the self, some bit of the KGS relationship gets across. Um, it also has some of his, um, literally 20 minutes before he passed away, he wrote some poems, and those are there. And. Um, we can talk about that later. Um, it's very personal and it's in his voice and my voice and the odd letter, so it is a little, in that sense, um, vulnerable. 
and it's 20 minutes so the title of the talk real and the imaginary comes from a quote by from one of his texts so between the real and the imaginary for KG Subramanian or Manida as we called him softly like warm breath on a cold mirror or a whisper on bare feet wearing only white he slipped away unable to resist before escaping a last glance how many shawls from Kashmir can you give a man who never visits the mountains for his birthday who prefers to stay in warm climates year after year or in daring a variation by buying him fabric for kurtas is it possible to match his sense of khadi aesthetics I confess I did both with some degree of success but soon found myself offering slices of my inner self instead gifts that were perhaps of little material value or shape or form or weight or volume but that gestured towards personal creativity over everything else the first attempts didn't make much of an impression the gifting of silver prints black and white photographs that made me proud met with polite acceptance the odd smile and the comment of where will i put these up not as complaint but just as rueful admission from a man whose interiors were full of shelves holding books in four five even six languages the books were a failed enterprise because after a while between the ones i published and the ones i admired the shelves had begun to sag besides that was a gifting that took place almost daily over the years when we met the birthday had to be a special thing i began to give him pages and pages of short and long poetic texts hesitating to use the term poetry or poems this started on his 80th birthday his body language on receiving these neatly printed sheaves of sheaves of paper of different kinds in large colored envelopes was welcoming as was the quiet smile the twinkle in the eyes would make me feel that i was on the right track but who knows if they were ever read or liked it wasn't until much later last year in fact in 2015 after 12 years of poetry that i received a comment it came in the form of one of his regular phone calls acha tum ab poet ban gaye ho that was it end of praise but not before he had rattled off from memory the two he liked soft like an angel's wing your breath upon my eyelids as i dream shyly of yet another autumn cushioning the falling leaves time uncertain of how long it had been running racing against its own shadow lengthening then he moved on immediately so where does the circus go next a playful reference to the sketches scribbles drawings exhibition that i had been traveling around the country for more than a year and a half and which showed no signs of stopping he was never at a loss for words to say behind your back kind words words of affection words that have made you blush with pride were they uttered in earshot but you get tempered versions of them anyway through a loyal grapevine i would often hear for example quote 
Only my dear friend Naveen is mad enough to carry large quantities of my paintings in trucks around the country, Lucknow, Bhubaneswar, Chandigarh, Patna, Bhopal. Otherwise, I wouldn't get shown all over to these young audiences. Mostly the paintings get shown and sold in the metros. Last week, his daughter Uma shared the last few entries written in the notebooks wrapped in brown paper. His texts echo his preoccupation with the exhibition and must have been written a few days before his hip fracture, one that would ultimately lead to his passing, his surgery. When they see you working, they often ask, are you working for a show? By which they mean a sale. For them, a painting is something material, a removable object that others will pay for. Decorate the houses or offices. That a painting is a device to open up your vision and extend its reach, broaden its coverage, does not readily occur to them. Here was a man who spent a lifetime affirming his faith in the gallery system, working with every gallery in the country that approached him. And yet, he remained outside the marketplace, never tempted by anything other than his muse, his art. I wrote a letter to him, September 12, 2012. Dear Manida, flat, obvious, ordinary, banal, how important it is to avoid being banal. Of the four deadly sins listed above, perhaps this is the worst. Oh, and to not realize that one is being banal is the fifth, ignorance, or the lack of self-knowledge. The inability to look at one's writing and say to oneself, this is banal. To be satisfied with anything one writes is to be dead, not physically, but emotionally. To be the act of writing is like playing Russian roulette with the veins in one's wrist blindfolded. Slash the wrist, let it bleed. If you're lucky, you will write the meaningful, the edgy, as close to a truth as you can get, or a lie, equally effective. After all, your life's blood is seeping out. You have little time left. You have to do this each time you dip your pen into the bottle. You have to perfect the art of dying each time. How else will the writing read like your life depends on it? It struck me that the same must apply to the art you create. Even more specifically, the daily gift of conversation when I visit you. I always come away refreshed, stronger. Nothing is planned or deliberate. Nothing too trivial or overtly solemn. Everything is intuitive, full of concern, relevant down to the last bit of the tabri that we share or the Vadilal coffee ice cream. Nothing is superfluous and yet, if an onlooker were to watch us from an invisible perch, they would not be able to gather from our exchanges the same philosophical truths I come away with. There is a flow that embraces both talking and silence without hesitation. You say things, I listen, respond, you react, I listen, we discuss. All this is stitched together with pauses. I am grateful for this, deeply privileged. The way you taught, the humaneness in your teaching is now completely lost. Teachers talk down these days. They do not include, nor do they raise the students to a level where self-worth, self-assurance and yes, self-knowledge reside. They dampen and intimidate and therefore command obedience. Not your way at all. I would go so far as to say that your every critical utterance is a blessing because it holds within it a way, a corrective measure, the possibility of doing something differently insight into approaching one's shortcomings in a positive sense. In other words, your teaching shows us the way forward. 
One last thing, then I will stop singing your praises for the rest of this letter. Your generous way of being, the manner in which you guess the areas of anxiety that I am often feeling, or the shyness with which I hesitate to ask, or remind, or refer to things I am brave enough to write to you about, but get diffident about for fear of being pushy in your presence. I refer to the way you gently and quite casually let me know that the three anatomy lessons were safe and kept for me, or that you haven't forgotten the five into five footers that I quietly but persistently kept bringing up over the last two years, or the freedom with which you allow me to plan exhibitions of your drawings, acrylics. Thank you indeed. I'm also very excited about the idea of the wall you're planning for the art fair and the manner of your mulling what the young call process and I call the magic of making. The twinkle with which you told the organizers that Abhi time here. It will happen if it will happen very quickly. Brought me back to my favorite exchange in one of our conversations when replying to the question, how long does it take to complete a painting? You answered with yet another twinkle, the time it takes to snap your fingers. I wish I could express in words the sense of pleasure you emanate when sharing ideas. Must have something to do with the connection one feels with one's child self. Let me explain. I think our best ideas are those that appeal to the child within us. The wonder that resides in that part of your head and heart that has quietly and safely protected those qualities of innocence and awe that children have a quality that never loses its sheen or luster because it refuses to grow up, refuses to let anything other than the purely intuitive rejoice at every pleasurable idea. What a gift then to be able to summon this quality each time you create. What joy. Thank you for your patience and with much respect and love. Naveen. He wrote like he painted, daily, lucid and clear writing without the prop of artifice, honest to its core, finely chiseled thought. Whether it was talking about art, education and the craft traditions in India or his painting, and I quote, My works have always sought to move between the real and the imaginary. True. What we call real is itself an image of a kind. My main interest was once in the passage of the objective to the abstract. Abstract to mean here an image of relative anonymity, which allowed it a variety of interpretations, gave it the ability to play various visual roles. Now the cross connections I am interested in are more complicated. The images are more than visual. They have a complex identity, diverse cultural associations and background lore. The image of Hanuman has a whole line of characters behind it, an intrepid monkey who ventures to capture the sun, who has the god of wind as father and gets from him speed, power, agility, volatility, and the ability to change in size. Later, a staunch devotee of Rama, his emissary and worshipful vehicle. His role changing from the playful and the comic to the heroic. In a Kathakali act, he delights his audience with his monkey tricks. In an iconic painting, he flies through the air, carrying a mountain on which grow life-saving herbs. Similarly, Durga has various versions, ranging from an elegant household deity, almost like a member of the family, to a multi-armed war goddess who rides a lion or tiger and fights and slays the buffalo demon. The lion or the tiger, even the monkey, symbolize the positive powers that fire and support our initiatives. The buffalo, on the other hand, represents a negative power or inertia. 
These images certainly have their origin in common scenes observed in a town or village. The vision of an able-bodied woman in a Jat village trying to control a runaway buffalo calf or a wiry Bengali villager doing the same, though with more physical skill than strength, give you two, images, two image sources for Durga. What I have an eye for are these sources, where the icon unfolds from the actual and holds within it hidden implications of the divinities inherent in human beings and their powers and the need of the human being to be constantly aware of the conflict between benevolent and malevolent forces the angel and the demon within himself he also wrote as a response to the times that you and I call political or cause driven though many decades of practicing his art and the art of being an involved human being and artist, he allowed himself to be deeply affected by the unfolding of the times and events around him, whether these were in our country or elsewhere. Quote, I think our response to events should come out of a deeply felt emotional reaction which ties up in turn with earlier experiences or reactions like Picasso's Guernica that moves from his response to the brutality of the bullfight to his response to war. I could at one time move in some of my terracotta reliefs from my response to the devastation of a flood to my response to the brutalities of the war in Bangladesh which eventually led to its liberation. Trying to underline the fact that the massacre of a group of human beings and their body count become marks of achievement for another group. But this can come about only when an outside event is perceived as an assault of one's being. Superficial topicality and didactism is something I choose to keep away from. There are many things happening in this world that force you to react against them and to be an activist, to speak against them or take other measures depending upon your competence and ability. Just painting against them is a poor gesture. I do not, however, disapprove of those who do. My choice is to be an artist-activist, not an activist-artist. And later, in his last televised interview on his 90th birthday, he said, there are many things in our lives that throw us into a state of anger. There are many things in our environment that irritate us. There are around us various social pressures we want to rebel against. Our lives are hemmed in with restrictions and frustrations of various kinds. In this over-inhabited inhabited world, there are various conflicts of interest that cannot be fully resolved. Administrators, social scientists, philosophers, priests, they all try in their own way to contain the conflicts. But the best incentive for civilized living can come only from loving the world. This alone will force everyone to live in peace, to care for the environment, like it was a common park. I remember hearing in my childhood a prayer my father used to sing. It had a line that went, Lord, let each day of mine be a festival, a celebration. In the brown paper-covered notebooks we found some more thoughts and what may well be his last unfinished poems. One, to fully appreciate a work of art or enjoy a poem, you should have a surprise meeting with it. There it is, all dressed to impress, and you're open to being overwhelmed. Two, our responses to works of art or literature can be of various kinds. To start with a surface relationship, sliding over it to keep up your senses. Then an encounter with its details, its context, story, its style. Then the discovery of a special feature that lifts you up into new horizon, like a tower. Three, 
a salt white sun sprinkled with pins of pepper floating floating with the smells of an early spring but the days are burning hot and the last one there is the old man who sits under the people tree and my response which he will not read gathering all the dust filled afternoons of a lifetime into the single line of a poem not yet complete i stepped into the twilight thank you <clears throat> naveen thank you so much for reading the text to us um as i said before this is net this text has never been published in india it will be published tomorrow in scroll for the first time it was written originally i believe in 2016 at the time when kg had Shortly been after, yeah, it he, he had been selected for documenta that's right and yeah. he'd been he'd shown which of course was a milestone in a sense no, it was shared with the documenta folks the some of the poems that i wrote were written almost in fact the earlier some of them were written on the plane to go to cremate him wow and then the piece was written in slightly yeah. karma yeah and for those of you who don't know documenta of course is is a major exhibition which takes place once every 5 years yeah. Yeah. and it certainly i think introduced kg subramanian to a yeah. new audience also both of these audience. works i refer to which is anatomy lessons yeah uh the canvas and the terracotta works and uh, the wall which is war of the relics was shown all the relics was in athens the rest was in kas this is the documenta that was with between two spaces but naveen in a sense this functioned as an in an elegy as an elegy of sorts to mm, to kg yeah. but i'd lo- i'd love to sort of take you back to the beginning of your relationship with him and how you know i mean to have got to a place of this extraordinary openness frankness intimacy with someone obviously takes time and it takes um effort from both parties to be able to solidify this kind of relationship so i'd love to know a little bit about how the relationship began how it matured um obviously we're talking to you today both as a publisher and as someone who uh represents has represented artists in a commercial sense as well um so these are different sort of facets and different hats that you wear but you wore them sort of in both you wore, wore both of them in in mm. the case of KG um and also I'd like to bring in your relationship to the art of letter writing and the epistolary act which seems so embedded in the text that you've written so maybe first if you can just begin about how the relationship how I think the the relationship goes back to uh, we started publishing in 82 and in 83 we were uh, approached by a very shy Shiva Kumar who was you know who's in many ways his uh, what's the word in the nicest possible way his protege archivist uh, huge affection and uh, he offered us a manuscript which later came out as living tradition and um of founding editor Shomik Banerjee who was more aware of KG Subramanian to me it was just a name i was discovering the joys of chitravanu mazumdar at that point and um so we went to shantiniketan shomik da of course said yes without hesitation and we went and we met him and um that was it so i came into his life as a publisher first but you know they did the course of the process of the book uh and certainly in those fledgling times uh even handloom times because this book was going to be hand set and block printed there was no offset yeah. even as an imagined thing for somebody like me learning on the job so there was a lot of back and forth so you caught a train you went you lunched you saw and every now and then you would be invited up to the studio you got to see work and you listen to these two intellects shomik and you know it was wonderful to kind of take all that in i was more i probably had in those days more conversations with sushila de his wife 
because she would practice her Punjabi with me, you see. So, you know, and my Rajma Chawal, as we used to call it, when she figured out that. So, it was that sort of a thing. It would take much more courage. And two books coming out, this and Creative Circuit, before in 89, I said to him, because I saw him painting these acrylics, and um, I said, I show Chitravanu Bazukdar, can I show you kind of thing, you know. So he said, sure. So we got hold of the Bidla Academy and we did a show, you know, it was sort of. So the showing and the publishing, that was really in a nutshell the way it happened. Um, there was parallelly, of course, what was happening was there was Shomnatho, Rebahor, you know, so you visited two people because he too, we were trying to get his Tebaga diaries and getting to show him, and, you know, which is a whole different story, but right. these two. So you went to Shantini Ketan yeah. and uh, you spent a day, literally, um, and the relationship kind of grew to one of, I think, a certain comfort level to be able to be yourself. There was not, uh, there was no kind of, I was in any case the kind of person who was desperate to be myself, but I had to force myself to be formal occasionally with older people. Um, so, it, you know, the first hint I got that I could quote-unquote flirt with him in a certain way, I, you know, it was fine and he was very responsive. He was also equally good to wrap you on your knuckles. And I remember at that time there was a... I designed my first catalogue, which was a Manuparik show. And uh, because I'm impatient with grids, it was a strange topsy-turvy, crooked sort of thing, which I was very proud of, 28 pages. I sent it to him and I said, tell me what you think. So he sent me 14 sharp pages of how bad the catalog <laughs> was. And I literally, I was threw a tantrum on the floor kind of thing. <laughs> but he said, you asked. And I realized it's true, he asked. I, you know, so since then, even now when I come across an envelope, yeah. we have a frequent envelope to you with you know, his handwriting, my heart would yeah. go Someone slightly can. like, what am I being you know, yeah. accused of yeah. and things. But it became much, yeah. much, much, much comfortable. And, but when I was really accepted, it was a very strange moment. This was when Sushila, they had to be rushed from Shantinigetan, which had no decent hospitals. And um, one of the reasons why he then migrated back to Baroda, and we rushed her by train, ICU for 30 days or more, and stayed at home. It was all kind of stuff. And um, then we got her ready enough to be taken to Ahmedabad and Baroda. The house had been bought meanwhile. He just took the decision of going. We got hold of nine Indian airline tickets, removed the seats. It was like a military operation stretcher get to Ahmedabad, you know, put them, hand them over to an ambulance Gosh. and that kind of stuff. And he was a meticulous keeper of accounts, including ringing you up after six months and saying that, uh, you know, Mortimer Chatterjee hasn't paid or, you know, Amal yeah. needs to be yeah. reminded. It's very, very. Yeah. And he would do a, a sort of, like I would book tickets and I would have an envelope before he'd settled his luggage in the, at home when he stayed with us, you know, whatever, 1623, you know. But it was, this was the first time. It's a very inverted, which I hope Rajit will understand this. It's a kind of Guru Shishya thing where you are gifted the opportunity of, or you save the embarrassment and you see this gift of um, we didn't talk money. I was not paid for these tickets. Nobody was concerned about... It was so wonderful to be... I don't know how to explain it any other way. It's a very vulnerable, nice moment and I felt accepted yeah. in a whole different way after some 35 years of, you know, whatever. So, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm just rambling on. No, no. no <laughs> and and in just in terms of the letter-writing aspect... The letter-writing aspect... Oh. Well, with him, you know, the, in the beginning there were some letters. And then it was just one-way traffic and a phone call back. 
you know, he would, <laughs> because it's too much, no? somebody's writing you 20 pages, hey, give it a break, he should be painting. So it was like, you know, he would talk to me. So we were regularly on the phone. And just tell me a little bit about this. But my letter. Your, your letter writing more generally and how that sort of plays yeah, such it's, an important um, part in. So the letter writing specifically uh, is, is a preferred form of my expression. And uh, I've been writing letters from my school days. And I think it, if you want a specific moment, it's a... It's a, is, this is an aunt of mine who uh, was married to a brigadier and they both retired and uh, she retired to Bias and became a Radhaswami and decided that the only reading member in that entire family was me. So I was sent huge amounts of books of the Radhaswami philosophy and usually an average 20-21 page handwritten letters explaining wow. them to me. So I had to show how wonderfully well-read I was. So I stayed opposite the British Council, so I would pick up every single Russell and all kinds of people I didn't understand and uh, copiously, but I was fairly, you know, ethical. I would quote them, but right. like two pages, three pages. So I was responding in this and it's, it fine-honed my handwriting, yeah. which now is a mess. But um, what it did was it created a sense of being able to write letters and enjoying the storytelling aspect and the receiving of them, which then if you jump many years, uh, and I've said this in various places, including the film that Pushan's made, that the art of letter writing then crossed, there was no distinction between writing you a love letter and uh, writing a business letter to a publisher. It was, it, was, it was just, you know, like I said, I was impatient to become comfortable and, you know. So I found that works very well. Later, it, it's like a strategy if you had planned it like one because people were never getting letters like this. So they're warm to you and, you know, the sharing and all the rest of it. Yeah. And this relationship letter writing succeeded with some people across cultures, across languages, across borders. Uh, at the moment, the one example I can give you is I'm in a correspondence for years with a German Reinhard Jürgel author where his 30-page letters in German go to a literary translators at 100 pounds, a thousand words, and my responses go to a German to English writer at you know, so it's like a very expensive romance, <laughs> yeah. but it's great fun, right? It sums up our publishing. Yeah. yeah. I can carry on. No, well, to return, <laughs> let, let's go back to KG and, <laughs> and let's pick up on one of the things that he says in a letter to you regarding the idea of the circus and what he's, what he's referring to there is the circus of art exhibitions which at that time you were travelling around India of his uh, not only to metropolises but mm. also to smaller yeah. spaces, smaller towns um, and you also mentioned that uh, he would have this wonderful habit of giving generously to galleries that asked yeah. for work. Sure. So what I'd like to get into next are two, <coughs> two ideas. Mm. One is this idea of his wanting to share his art generally with a public, with an audience and I'd like you to really tell us what, what you feel he thought about audiences, the plural, plurality of audiences on one side. The second is his relationship with the art market and galleries uh, which I think have seen mm. a large shift in terms of the way that the artist gallery relationship has moved, especially since, mm -hmm. let's say, the early 2000s. And you've seen that shift with, with him. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you could talk to both yeah, of these. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, in those days, you, you, you could be with, in multiple relationships, you know, with galleries. And uh, I'll start with the gallery thing, because it's... Um, you, re you will remember, you know, Firoza certainly will, that in those days you were... There wasn't enough outlets for showing your art, right? There were the Lalit, not Lalit Kalas in those days, but, you know, there were government places you could show them in, you know, Art and Craft Institute. Or, but there was no organized space. And then these few galleries came up. 
And so that was a welcome, pleasant thing for artists. But nobody, it was all on trust. And for me, it was a parallel exercise in my publishing world at that time. I was doing no contracted relationships with Minal Sen, for example, or Marshata Devi, you know where, so you were kind of, you stayed, it, in fact later it became some kind of inverted snobbery for me that Mortimer wants to work with me, then, you know, I mean, there are no conditions, he just works with me and when he thinks it's not working, he moves on. You do not tie people down yeah. contractually and that kind of stuff. But he was very generous about, he believed in the gallery system because he saw it come into being. So even occasionally when they disappointed him, how do galleries disappoint? They do something either wrong or something appears like, you know, you have a nine part work and you can't sell the whole work, so you sell it to nine individuals. And, but he would just laugh it off and I was the one getting all huffy and, yeah. you know, annoyed and that kind of stuff. So there was that side of uh, him. But I discovered, to go back to this whole touring stuff, is I felt a little claustrophobic about Delhi, Bombay, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Bangalore maybe, if you're lucky, Chennai, but it was like becoming the same places in those days, you'd hire a Jahangir and, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or sometimes, you know, you could work with friends like Gita or Al Kazi and, you know, there was a, there was a kind of trust. It was, it was comfortable and we were never a threat because we didn't have the economy of a commercial gallery. We were working with two, three people. So it was not like a, you know, so everybody accepted the fact that you could collaborate and we were be generous and... Or perhaps you were seen as an artist agent as well as... I a, don't a, think no? so, no, because the artist in this case, both of them were very, very much in command. Mm. So if I didn't meet him for six months, Somebody else would have been doing a show if it was ready. It's when you, you know, so it was a very, nobody thought about it consciously like we do today where you have nice formal relationships or relationships of trust and you don't appear to encroach on other people. But what was exciting for me was when I mooted the idea that what if my understanding is that all these small places in India have Lalit Kalas languishing with sometimes, uh, you know, uh, artists who haven't made, who've had to work for other things to do their printmaking or their, and they were running these places. So I just, you know, went to Bhubaneshwar, and I went to Lucknow, I remember, and I met and saw these lovely spaces. And I said, I remember Bhubaneshwar, in fact, was the first one. And I said, I'll bring you this exhibition at my cost. And of course, there's nothing for sale. Uh, so he listened to all this but looked very bored and said well this is fine, great, do it but I just come back from Vienna and there was a burgundy wall in this gallery will you paint them burgundy? I said I will paint them burgundy but you will paint them back white? he said yes so you know it was like so some of them were enthusiastic right. but I discovered very quickly that the footfalls were tremendous really? The, uh, I was telling you, the, the, you know, the newspapers and the vernacular, radio, you know, it was like yeah. young people, you know, we, we took his magic of making and we did these little 50 page essays, essays, essays at yeah. 50 rupees each. In a 10 day exhibition in Patna, it sold 92,000 rupees worth, which means about 200 sets or something. I mean, like the math was crazy. So there must have been lots of footfalls. Yeah. Yeah. So. This carried on for 10 years, you know. It yeah. started as one thing yeah. and then I started to show Madhvi and Shomnadda and we, yeah. we showed some younger people. Well, that was an interesting thing. By then the younger were, their reality was slightly different. They needed to sell. With these guys, the selling was happening in any case. So right. because I didn't see myself as a profit center in the way a commercial gallery should, I thought, okay, so I've sold three Subramanians to somebody in Delhi or Bombay, that takes care of a year's touring for like six cities. I wasn't just saying, no, but that's the profit for my gallery and now I need to figure out where to get sponsorship. So it was a kind of thing, right, which is part of how we do things at Seagull. And um, he loved it because he was actually visibly, and he would come. He would. To a co lot of these openings, you know, 
Kerala, Bhubaneswar, you know, whenever he was good at that, as long as he could. Of his own volition, he wasn't being pushed by you, he actively wanted to be... Yeah, yeah, I'd be pushed in the sense that I would say, would you like to come? And he sure. said, chalte hai. and then he'd pack up and he would show up. And I wasn't paying for it in the sense that he wouldn't let me. So, and the local host was so delighted, they would put him up and that kind of thing. So we discovered, and I, when I talked to the younger artists like Pemud Laskar and one or two other people, Feza, we showed them, but I realized it was a strain. They needed to sell. They couldn't just be part of an experiment yeah. that, um, yeah. you know, because they were not big names that were selling in the cities anywhere. So, it was a, so it's obviously not working for, yeah. but it is an alternative circuit that's available, it exists as infrastructure. And do you think at some level it relates to, in his own mind, it relates to initiatives such <coughs> as the annual finance faculty fair in Baroda, his relationship to, to writing and getting the message out to broader audiences? In essence, what I'm trying to get at is in his own philosophical understanding of the place of art within hmm. our own lives, he felt very strongly that... Oh, yeah, it the was definitely. The fact that, you know, it wasn't all about so-called informed urban audiences or sophisticated audiences, which are wonderful and which exist. Um, but what we discovered was that there was a fairly informed audiences in these... They just didn't have the exposure. <coughs> They wanted to see, so informed in the way you would seek out knowledge, right? But not comfortable mm. in, with interpretations maybe, or, you know, this is the way I read this, none of that stuff, which, like classical music, you get trained to because in urban centers you get that exposure. You know, yes. you travel the world, but you're sitting in a small place, you can't. So I think that notion was there. It's there in his writing, you know. Yeah. He's there in his relationship with craft, uh, for example. Uh, and I think those Pupulja careers must have helped fine hone a lot of that. Yeah. And he writes about it. Yeah. And then also, when in terms of his own relationship with education and pedagogy, mm. when he's entering into Baroda, coming out of Shantiniketan, and then when he goes back to Shantiniketan, in a sense his ideas around education also seem to feed into mm. a lot of these ideas. Did sure. he speak to you about those as, as his publisher now rather than as his dealer? Well, how, did, how did those conversations progress and also your interest in publishing those writings of his where he's mm. talking more specifically about policy making, yeah. education? He's written about all of these. They all exist, particularly about uh, set of letters. So typically he would be approached by, let us say, in those days very specifically Arjun Singh was a human resource culture, I, I think the human resource development. And um, there's an exchange where, you know, they're expecting him to come on board with public art, arts education policies, all of that stuff. And he gives, he starts with a very bristly, scathing, um, kind of um, expose, if you like, of earlier existing things that have fallen. He reminds them of existing programs in quite the way we do today's political world and with other schemes and stuff. But he doesn't stop at what in the beginning seems like an attack. And this was the hallmark of him as a teacher that I speak about, which is that he would then give you a blueprint number one and a blueprint number two and a blueprint for Kerala and a blueprint for Marat. He was very good yeah. at that level. Um, he would call them up and said, I'm sorry, I've written you the sharp letter, but... Yes. This was, you know, so there was a kind of... Um, I think that had to do with the teaching. Yeah. Where you can, uh, but you don't stop at, yeah. you know, uh, squishing somebody, but you try and, uh, you know, in the same way we go backstage and say how wonderful was your play and then it's actually we mean quite the opposite. But yeah. it would be lovely to be able to go and say, I need some time, I'm sorry, yeah. this is not working for me. And then discuss, you know, and which, which I've done and yeah. it sometimes works. Yeah. So 
that bit was a life lesson for all of us that he could actually approach this uh, in different aspects of his practice but he was he was uh, really he would take up any initiative if other than government sources came up with for example even at kalabhavan which was i mean they were constantly selling doing prints all of them him shomnath or and the bureaucracy couldn't take the money for this it would take 2 years so they couldn't do the workshop they needed or get a artist in residence you know so yeah. but this this sort of hand loom problem solving with your own produce yeah. so you put your money where your mouth yeah. is you know yeah. that we we had a huge fire in 97 when our you know uh, 500 square foot pavilion at the calcutta book fair was so within two months he produced a set of 25 6 or 8 in each big prints and said sell these you know Amazing. yeah so yeah so i want to talk now about the different registers at which your relationship function with kg now mm. i'd like to talk about the playful aspect of what aspect the playful playful in particular obviously you have published his children's books oh yeah and yeah. he was I think making them from the early 60s onwards and I don't know for those of you who saw uh no he did that I think he did that at, did he do that at NID those children things and Baroda no Baroda Baroda I think first at Baroda yeah, yeah 62 I think yeah, was the yeah his first Baroda but obviously the playful is something that was very important well, to no, him no he was him. very playful I'll just give you two examples for the I playful I want more than two examples no. that's <laughs> <laughs> no no he he would you know it's like uh, I remember he would uh, So he was a great switcher of channels. So after you had dinner, you sat down and you, you know, if Uma was there, you would get coffee ice cream basically and chocolate and whatever. And um he would have an effortless conversation with you but flipping channels. He used to flip to advertisements as much as he could. disconcerting well if if you were sitting within this away but if you were sitting your back to the tv who cares <laughs> but you know god often the sound was off you know, just yeah. flipping in not for very long and then if you were intelligent enough to distract him then you could you know it could be put aside and you could kind of carry on and stuff um i was excited by it for some totally strange reason because for me nothing is a distraction it all comes to your becomes your book cover or your photograph or your painting and you know so i like that so i used to fantasize that look this is popular culture and all and then in some conversation somewhere in some very erudite forum he's actually made some point which i forget but i remember the film so there was a film called chini kam with bachchan he talks about chini kam and he talks about chini kam the advertisement that was spawned from the film to make a point of some artistic merit <laughs> so you know there was yeah. but he was very comfortable with all that kind of stuff yeah and i remember once he used to give me these little birthday paintings would come with this handwriting so first heart thumping knowing it's a gift but anyway and then sometimes i cheated because if i would happen to be with him say october and my birthday is in january and i liked something that i coveted i'd say can i please buy Put this he said no no just take it and then i would hope like hell that he would forget he gave me this in lieu of the birthday present the second one would come and did it <laughs> but so there was this painting which was very lovely it's still there and it's just a sort of like a woman sitting like this you know looking you straight in the eye orange is turquoise blue and you know bare chested just kind of and so he came and stayed with us so our house is full of his works and occasionally i would change things to show him stuff he hadn't seen and you know it was like a gallery he'd come and stay for 3 4 days and this painting for years was as you entered the door so if that's your door the first painting there so that if you're sitting on the sofa here you get to see it and his sofa was here you would see this and he just i there was something with the painting that had looked familiar to me and 6 years later one morning over coffee he says konkona what <laughs> everything fell into place there was a konkona sen air about the posture of that woman and i'm saying my <laughs> god this guy this film is like that. you know so there was all this kind of stuff yeah. um yeah. 
And it feeds yeah. into the practice as well, right? It's yeah, it feeds into totally. the work, it feeds into yeah. the, the, the illustrations. And he would, he's, I've seen him give interviews for school magazines to 9-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 14-year-olds for two hours, you know. It was like before exhibition. It was important to him. <laughs> he would, he, it's like I was, you know, I've said this the other day in some context, which is that I was in, a, in the beginning when I'd met these two, Shobhanath Thor always and him, uh, I was clueless about lost wax and all that kind of stuff. But I couldn't show that I didn't know, so I used to nod. And, uh, anu, on the other hand, when she first met Shobhanath Thor, so tell me all about this lost wax. I said, oh God, I should take notes. <laughs> I'd be too embarrassed to ask, you know. So he was yeah. very good with people who just asked Blatto yeah. what seemed like an obvious stupid question. So I learned then to yeah, yeah. Uh, inquire, what is a reverse painting? How does it, what do you mean yeah. by filling in that? So it was an interesting, yeah. Um, yeah. you know. I don't want to monopolize Naveen. So if people have questions uh, or comments, please do let us know. Um, otherwise, what I do want to talk about, Naveen, is the centena centenary and the fact that uh, this exhibition and the previous one actually functions as Yeah, it sort of kicks off the... Uh, it's the centenary of his birth year in The centenary is not going to be a rigid thing. We just carry on till 25, I but suppose. What, what, what ideas do you have in mind if you don't... No, I'm only focusing it? on the fact that I'm assuming, rightly or wrongly, that there are at least two major collections that we're all aware of, which is, of course, Al Ghazi Sahib's The Art Heritage and... Uh, then there's the Kiran Nadal thing, you know, there are smaller ones, but I do know that these two will show major, presumably, exhibitions and stuff. So I wanted to focus in the aspect that we talked about, which is his relationship with galleries. So, I mean, without making it like some kind of a mad open market or a flea market, with, you know, collaborating with... Uh, you guys, it's already begun. Imami is considering something which Nancy, we hope, will curate. So the idea is to, in a sort of organic, word of mouth way, have invite them curatorially to look at what the estate has, what are the drawings, and you know, to curate interesting things. Uh, because you know, at the single level, we've seen so much of it. You kind of. I didn't want it to be necessarily us yeah. doing things. And then I'm hoping these will crisscross each other. What I'd like us to do, again, wherever possible with partnerships with other galleries, is the half a dozen people that we've worked with who have, some of them been his students, some of them been his colleagues, like Manu Parekh was his colleague at Weaver Center, for example. So you, you don't want them to do tribute shows that sort of show his work or not. So you, they work in the same medium. So somebody with terracotta, regu, someone in ceramic, somebody in reverse. Pay, you know, so yeah. have half a dozen of these satellite ones, and which also crisscross. So yeah. that that and lots of publishing. There's lots of yeah. reprints and other books yeah. and catalogues. I want to put out a few volumes of the catalogues because there's so much fake that happens uh, between Shiv Kumar and me. I mean, we could have made a a substantial fortune by, uh, you know, saying yes to fakes. Yeah, this it's amazing. Been, so many photographs yeah, I yeah. get on my feed, yeah. and they're all very able-looking paintings. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. we can actually recognize cannibalizing four or five works and putting together one. Sometimes you're going because in this there's no science to this here. Um, so you, you you get like a five feet by two feet canvas suddenly and you know he's never painted one that size. So that's the first bell. Then he always signed in Tamil but somebody uses another language. Oh, it's like little little things like that. And I presume because of his prolific... So, so I use Shiv Kumar as the, Arbiter. The, the main source of whatever because he remembers and he has a fairly substantial archive of images and we have some. But KGS uh, himself didn't keep a register of sorts of the bigger paintings. No, no, he did. He was very meticulous. But the um, actual transparencies are all at the Shiv level. Everything archival at that level. And then we have everything by way of... The, we substantially have thousands of images of drawings and stuff. Yeah. 
But what is interesting is that, you know, I feel that the more you can put out for artists in the world, in the public yeah. domain, the yeah. less there is, yeah. you know, it's not going to stop this industry, but it, you know, it gives you something that looks... Yeah. I suppose you, you are, in a sense, one of the first people who has been thinking about the idea of estates and artist estates in the contemporary Indian context. There are not many others that I can think of. I mean, of we do it, and it's a reality in publishing terms. Yeah. We handle... Yeah. So, I think that there's a, there's a lot that can be learnt, actually, from the example you've already set in terms mm. of how one can work with an artist in their own lifetime, but then also, once they're passed, how mm. then one keeps the legacy mm. going. Did he talk to you about his wishes for what he wanted to happen after his passing? Well, not as a, like a, it wasn't a daily conversation or a concern. He had settled his affairs uh, uh, in terms of certainly protecting Uma. Uh, his know, his so, daughter. His daughter. And um, he was very, what we were clearly told which, uh, was that, I mean, the, like it was my responsibility to send all the books you know, to Shantiniketan and, and all the rest of it. And um, the paintings and Uma were in our care. But it was not like a written edict. Yeah. You know, it was, a, it was just, he would have spent two seconds telling you this and then, you know, yeah. move on with the, uh, finding it awkward or whatever. And, um, and then when he passed away, he surprised all of us because, uh, I had by then, I, he'd called me once and I went to Baroda and he had a, the staircase to the studio had a kind of room which was always locked and used to joke about it like this is Umar's room. And uh, again, we've talked about it in the film. Um, at 93, the year he died in fact, he said, uh, I don't seem to be going anywhere, so let's open this room. And there were 38 works and all in. He was ready to discard and chuck them away. I said, don't be silly, we'll restore them. So we restored yeah. them all and sold them in his lifetime. And, you know, at substantially yeah. good yeah. prices, which was wonderful. And um, then he sent me what something I'd coveted for the longest time was his, some 400 odd drawings, sketches and the uh, sketches, scribbles and drawings. But I thought that was it. That is it. Part of me was... Retrospectively, I think I shouldn't have worried. <coughs> I was worried about the way the world would descend on Uma. Right. And um, as it happens, she actually surprised everybody by being absolutely marvelous looking after her life. Um, because in the eyes of the world, she looked very dependent on him in a certain kind of way. And so when I got this, I was partly a sigh of relief that at least it's here. One can look after it, etc. Then when Shiv and I went after he died to his studio, and you know, they have this Delhi style built in cupboards and this large wall, two, two bits of your partition type thing, and meticulously wrapped in orange, blue and red fabric. The way you do accounting books, you wrap them. It was this last laugh on contemporary archivists. Every single ticket stub, drawings, sketches, this period, Oxford sketch. All oh, there. So Shiv and I looked at each other and said he's given a lot of work for the next 12 years. <laughs> All this has to be published. So that's what we're doing. We're just right. showing, exhibiting, Amazing. publishing. Yeah. Yeah. And Shiv is tracking down uh, antecedents, where yeah. is the strong witch here. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting. And on that happy note, we move are there, to some... Are there any questions <laughs> for... Sure. Sorry, Nalini, can I just ask you to speak in the microphone? It's just oh. there. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you whether you ever witnessed uh, his relationship with Tayyab in Shantaniketan. Relationship with? Tayyab. 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 In, in, in the sense that uh, not as much as I would have liked to, but uh, I knew Tayyab and the Shanti Nikita in particular where we first saw, in fact we both saw the film together, it was such a pleasure, his 16mm thing he did called Kudal, yeah, yeah. you should remember, 
and in fact um, Manida told me that I should show his work and in those days I'd just begun to show Meera Mukherjee and makeshift galleries and stuff and his Shanti Niketan work was meant to be shown by us, Tayebs and then something very odd happened which is that the first Meera Mukherjee exhibition was in the parking lot of a gentleman, businessman who was at war with his neighbor who was a barrister of some considerable crankiness. So when the exhibition opened there was a raid by customs and police oh, no. saying that these murtis have smuggled gold in them. <laughs> so we stopped the exhibition within hours and I, was, and I lost the space. So unfortunately I lost a wealth of uh, all pun intended <laughs> Tayyip's works. <laughs> But their relationship, I, mean, I, I, I didn't see it unfold in front of my eyes in there, but I just, you know. Because I heard there. from Tayyab a lot about his yeah. uh, experiences with, uh, with KG. So you should tell the, us about that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's more to do with his uh, interest in Maisa Sur Mardini. Oh, yeah. That whole That's, series. And mm -hmm. that guy, Which is by Kudal Works, very interesting. That's what, yeah, exactly, with the buffalo and all that. Um, but from his side, I have uh, very mm. interesting accounts, Tayyab's mm. side. Yes. But mm. from KG's side, of course, mm. I didn't know him that well as I knew Tayyab. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was a, a, a whole change came over Tayyab after yeah. Shantini no, no, Ketan. Of course. And of course. Shantini Ketan because of uh, KG. And he was there for a spell. It yeah, yeah. Like uh, a almost a year. Yeah, it, it was a very, a very important year yeah, for him. Very yeah. A lot came out of it. Yeah. And his whole intellectual mm. change as well of how to. Look at the, the the Indian pantheon and mm -hmm. things like that, and that's how he felt convinced enough to be able to make an icon like yeah. uh, Mahesh. I knew him a little before that because we had just started to publish, and he was the first one. Both of them reached out for the Prithvi bookstore they used to run. That's Sakina was running that. Yeah, yeah. so Sakina and uh, Thaybudri. So that's and then I was so pleasantly surprised that I'm in and out of Shantini Gate, and there he is. And he wasn't very. Um, I mean, he was shy. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, in one of the letters which Naveen read out today from KG to mm. you, I think his, it, mm. when he talks about Durga yeah. and Hanuman and this, this move, there's a lovely line which he has where he sort of talks about these works where yeah. he's going from the abstract objective to, to the yeah. abstract and then the move mm. which obviously is through his conversations with Dayab and others to talk about, to think about the icon and the archetype through... Because it's a very rare thing that happens, you know, that two artists of yeah. this calibre, KGS yeah. and uh, yeah. Dayab... It's like if, even with Shomnath and uh, KGS, there was a yeah, that's also strong true. thing, yeah, but yeah. you never... Yeah. Mm. I mean, the only jokes with that Shomnath would allow himself was I don't understand how this money does it. He's writing, he's publishing, he's painting, he's teaching, he's exhibiting. I'm stuck for two years doing one bronze, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like that. But uh, he used to marvel. Somnath was a very depressive kind of person. He was. It, no, I don't think he was that, No, he wasn't. Yeah. Well, I suppose I would have. Yeah, there were anxieties, but I think. Um, um, yeah, but. There's well, many compared to KGS, it was yeah, a oh yeah, totally, totally different K temperament. Because KGS was more at ease and comfort and secure with everything. And he thought problems were meant for solving and not creating anxieties. And also you have to remember that Shobhanadda and Jevadi were far more, uh, you know, they, they shunned the social and the public, even though he was teaching and so on and so forth. And it's the same way, and I'm sorry to bring my little political end up here because there are all kinds of articulations, but um, Reba Hoor was not a anguished, depressed, pushed down by Shomnatho kind of woman or wife or whatever. She was a barrister's daughter, very articulate, and she could kick ass. She was, um, she chose to be in the shadows not his, just in the shadows and to work. And it took me many years to convince her to allow me because she thought that I was actually coveting Shomnatho. So I had to say that to her, I had to actually articulate.
to a shy person that I think you think that I want his bronzes, which he gifts me anyway. So what more could I ask for? So I want to show you, because I feel that for the last four years I've been only, only focusing on him, and I've suddenly discovered your work, on the other hand, is not secretive, like his is, hidden in trunks, but it's scattered all over. I want to... Once she allowed it, then for 20 years we kept showing, and she was prolific. The only condition was a ceiling of pricing, because as a good lefty that she was, she actually said she used to be very upset with this Shomnath, because he was giving in to being discovered as a market thing, you know. So all this was there. So there are, you know, I, I, I'm only saying this because there are attempts which are popular about making her sound like she was like some browbeaten something, not at all, including her writings and stuff. Sorry. So, uh, did he ever talk about Vinod Bihari and his experience of doing the mural? He, he, he not it? only talked about it, he's written about it. Or there are, about yeah. it but In fact, all those essays were, yeah. He would, he, every conversation would go between the Nandalals and the Binod Biharis and, you know, uh, and the Gandhis of the world. And, you know, it's like a, it's one of the reasons why, you know, we had attempted, Pushan and I, to do, uh, very keen on doing, uh, it didn't happen sadly because of me, which is that we wanted to do a film. And um, it was crazy because then you would have to be wired up at 6 a.m. when we woke up either in his house or ours and you would have these conversations and depending on whose house that person would make the tea and then there would be bathing and coffee breaks and conversations and silences and studios and going to Gulambais and you cannot, I mean there are some things that had to remain in the head. So we failed to, and all the other films except for Shaji's are a disaster because of him, because Manida used to take control of the film, okay. and so it didn't work. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to slowly draw us to a close. There, we, the idea is for our party, those of you who are not yet arted out, to progress to Experimenta, who are also having an opening this evening. So um, I think Only some of us are going to, to move over there. Um, but of course, if you've not seen the show here, please, please, see the show. please take some time to enjoy it. But uh, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Naveen, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you, sir. Thanks, thanks, thanks. And we hope to see you soon at an exhibition at the gallery. Thank you, thank you.